Welcome to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. My name is Monty Collier. I'm the teaching elder of Geneva Dutch Calvinist Church in Kingsport, Tennessee. We are on question 8 of the Shorter Catechism, so let's get started. Question 8. How doth God execute His decrees? Answer. God executeth His decrees in the works of creation and providence. The definition of creation and providence is covered in questions 9 and 11 of the Shorter Catechism, so we will not go over that here at this time. Instead, we will use this opportunity to discuss the differences between supra- and infralapsarianism. Now, sometimes infralapsarianism is referred to as sublapsarianism, but in this lecture we will refer to it as infralapsarianism. Please do not be intimidated by the vocabulary. You must remember that whenever you enter any discipline of study, there is a vocabulary in which you must master, and these terms, though they may sound intimidating, once you get to know them, they are really not. It would be unthinkable to run into a law graduate who did not have a legal vocabulary. The same is with Christianity. If you run into a Christian, he is going to have a Christian vocabulary. You must master the vocabulary. Now, when we discuss the Lapsarian views within Calvinism, we are discussing the logical order of God's eternal decrees. Now, what we are not discussing is whether or not God decreed Adam to fall. We are not discussing whether or not God determined for Adam to sin. Both infralapsarians and supralapsarians agree that God's eternal decree extends to the fall and that God decreed for Adam to fall in the first place. You will hear some people say that infralapsarians believe that God did not decree the fall. This is false. If you are an individual who believes that God did not decree the fall, then you're not even a Calvinist, period. You're a Pelagian, an Arminian, Roman Catholic, something like that. You're certainly not a Calvinist. So again, infralapsarians and supralapsarians both agree that God determines whatsoever comes to pass, even the sins of mankind. Now another thing that both infra- and supralapsarians agree upon is that all things which come to pass come to pass for the glorification of God in Christ and His Church. The difference arises when we come to discuss how God has logically ordered the decrees, the means in which to accomplish the ultimate end, which is His own glorification. A simple way of looking at this is that infralapsarians believe that God has first decreed the fall of mankind, and from all of fallen mankind, he then elected some unto salvation and left the others within their sin. On the other hand, superlapsarians believe and teach that God's decree to elect precedes his decree to have Adam fall into sin and thus plunge the human race into sin. Now, right away, you may realize that the infralapsarian idea here cannot apply to God's angels. Louis Burkhoff points this out in his Systematic Theology when he says, The predestination of the angels can only be understood as superlapsarian. God did not choose a certain number out of the fallen mass of angels. The predestination of the angels would seem to favor the superlapsarian position, for it can only be conceived as superlapsarian. From his Systematic Theology, page 113 and 121. Well, this does show that the superlapsarian scheme is appropriate for angels. The question is, is it appropriate for men? If uh, God can use the superlapsarian scheme to determine the angels, then why not men? So again, the question is, does God uh, simply choose to discriminate between men as simply men, which is superlapsarianism, or does God simply determined to discriminate between men as they are considered sinners, which is the infralapsarian perspective. Both views place God's discrimination of men upon his sovereignty. Neither view claims that God's decree to elect or reprobate is based upon the actions of men, fallen or otherwise. Let me go ahead and give you the infralapsarian scheme, and then I'll give you the superlapsarian scheme, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Infralapsarianism teaches that God first decreed His own glory in Christ and His church. Next, God decrees to create the universe. Then God decrees to fall a man. Then God decrees to elect some unto salvation and pass by others, preterition or reprobation. And finally, God decrees Christ to be the head of His church and the mediator between God and the elect. Now, I think that one of the best 
examples of the superlapsarian scheme comes from Herman Hoeksema's classic work in theology simply titled Reformed Dogmatics. Hoeksema writes, First, God wants to reveal his own eternal glory in the establishment of his covenant. Secondly, for the realization of this purpose, the Son becomes the Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, that in him, as the first begotten of the dead, all the fullness of God might dwell. Third, for that Christ in the revelation of all his fullness, the church is decreed and all the elect. In the decree of God, Christ is not designed for the church, but the church for Christ. The church is his body and serves the purpose to reveal the fullness there is in him. Fourth, for the purpose of realizing this church of Christ, and therefore the glory of Christ, the reprobate are determined as vessels of wrath. Reprobation serves the purpose of election as the chaff serves the ripening of the wheat. This is in harmony with the current thought of Scripture, and we find it expressed literally in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3 and 4, where it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Finally, in the counsel of God, all other things in heaven and on earth are designed as means to the realization of both election and reprobation, and therefore of the glory of Christ and his church. And because in the decree of God all things are conceived in this manner, in this manner, therefore all things must work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And in this light we can also understand scripture when it teaches us, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 21 through 23, that all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is Herman Hoeksema's giving of the superlapsarian scheme. I think it's an excellent uh, demonstration of superlapsarianism. Taken from his Reformed Dogmatics, chapter 5, page 165. Dutch theologian Louis Burkhoff criticizes the infralapsarian position. He thinks that it simply does not show the unity between the divine decrees. You can read his criticism of infralapsarianism on page 124 of his Systematic Theology. Now, personally, I believe the superlapsarian position is clearly seen in Romans chapter 9. Uh, verse 21, for example, says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Here we see the lump representing all of mankind simply as mankind. They are not portrayed here in this chapter as being a fallen lump, a sinful lump of clay. It is just simply a lump of clay. So I think this best represents mankind as mankind. And this supports the superlapsarian position. God's fitting part of the lump unto honor represents God's eternal decree of election, while God's fitting the other part of the lump unto dishonor represents his divine decree of preterition or reprobation. Let me end this lecture by stating that most of the greatest theologians throughout history have been superlapsarian. The greatest theologian, in my opinion, Gordon H. Clark, fantastic superlapsarian, uh, Herman Hoeksema, Francis Gomaris, William Twiz, head of the Westminster Assembly of Divines, Theodore Beza, these are magnificent superlapsarians. Uh, my favorite infralapsarian theologian is the Puritan John Owen. So, uh, you know, don't hesitate to read his works. He's fantastic.